Hello everyone, welcome to Life Questions. I'm Bill Harris, your host. We have been sifting through your viewer questions about life that you have sent us, and today we will be addressing many of them. Now, joining us today is a panel of local ministers who have also been looking over your viewer questions from a biblical perspective. And they are here with their answers that we hope will really minister to you today. Let's meet these fine pastors. First off, we have Pastor Greg Fox of two churches, New Hope United Methodist Church, and that's it. Well, that's in Rawson. And then also there is the Bluffton Trinity United Methodist Church that he pastors as well. Next, we have Pastor Randy Davis of the Bridge Church in Lima, Ohio, followed by Pastor Ben, ben Neff of the Mount Tabor Church of God in Salina. And rounding off our panel today is Pastor Patrick Hamler of Westminster Christian Church. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you all here today. Okay. Now, Let's do this. There's a question here that um, we got in from viewers. I want to read this question, and then I'd like to follow up, up with a scripture that will give us some perspective for discussion. How often should you pray, and what should you pray about? Now, I'm thinking in terms of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and I've asked Pastor Ben to, to read that very quickly for us. Sure thing. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. All right. Now it says praying for kings and those in authority. Of course, in this country, we don't have kings. We have presidents and the like. There's a lot of turmoil, of course, political turmoil in this world, and it has even gotten into the church for that better. Mm -hmm. uh, is the scripture calling on us to pray for politicians, even though we may or may not agree with their political philosophy, that we pray nonetheless for them? Well, I, I assure you that the call to pray for kings and people in authority, there were people that were way worse uh, that they were specifically referring to than anyone that we currently have in, in government today. You know, they were asking for prayers. Most likely they were asking, hey, you should pray for Nero. You should pray for Trajan. You could, well, Trajan's a little far out, but you know, Nero was, was about as bad as they get as far as Roman emperors go. And yet the call was regardless to pray for him and to pray for those in authority. So that doesn't mean that you like the person. It doesn't mean that you don't vote against the person when the time comes, if you think that someone else can run the, the place better. But that does mean that you do pray for them, that you pray for them in, in any circumstance, and that you lift up all of our leaders. We have a number of people who serve in our, our cities and our towns. And, and quite frankly, what they do impacts you on more of a day-to-day -day basis than anyone who's up in Washington. Um, so you always want to pray for good, godly counsel, uh, regardless of where they are. I was just thinking, you know, one of the things I think of when, when we become born again and God gives us his unconditional love. And I was thinking about this this morning is it, I need, then need to have unconditional love for others. I can pray better for you if I have a loving spirit than a judgmental spirit. So if I'm looking down my nose at you thinking I'm praying because God said so instead of, man, God loved me when I was unlovable. And I got to love others when they're unlovable or I don't agree with or whatever it is. And I, I think when, when you're praying and you look at that scripture, it, it's an, with an unconditional love that only God can give us. I don't want to pray for people that talk bad about me. I don't want to pray for people that use me. I don't want to pray for people that stole from me or hurt my kids. That's not an option. It, it's because God gave me unconditional love. I need to have that same love in my prayer life and how I treat people in every area of my life. And that should flow out of us if we've truly experienced God's unconditional love. Now, again, it's okay that you got mad at somebody or didn't want to pray for them. I get that. He never said, we talked earlier and just talking as pastors, uh, you don't have to like everyone. But God did say love one another as mm -hmm. I've loved the church. Okay, again, if there is a politician in office that perhaps you disagree with, should you be praying for that person, Absolutely. according Absolutely. to First Timothy? Mm -hmm. You know, as Patrick two. said, and, and as, as uh, Ben has said, we don't have to like them, we don't have to agree with them, but God charges us to love everyone. Yeah. And what better way can you show love for someone than to pray for them? Absolutely. Even mm -hmm. your worst enemy, the, the person who has done your family wrong, or whatever the case is, 
a true mm -hmm. Christian who really has felt the unconditional love of God, he loves us in spite of our faults and our shortcomings. Mm -hmm. We are to do the same. And what specifically should we be praying about and how often should we be praying? Um, you know, I wrote real big on my paper, burden. <laughs> we, we can pray about everything. And a lot of times I, I've been teaching on prayer with the youth for the past few weeks and just thinking about how we screw it up in church so often. We get together and we list out everybody's ailments and we come together and I'll be like, well, Aunt Jenny and Uncle Billy and everyone. And we haven't been praying about that person at all, but we want to share it in the gossip session of what's going on. And then we might throw up a brief prayer, but we don't have a burden about that. I mean, we could pray about a million uh, tummy aches and, you know, everything else that's wrong. But what do we have a burden about in our in our heart? And so we carry these burdens and that's what we pray about. And in a way, we ask the Lord to give us a burden that he has, you know, give us his heart. And so all of a sudden we look at our leaders in office uh, locally and 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 nationally, too. And, but we have a burden for their salvation and we pray for them. And so whatever burden he puts on our heart, we pray about, but we don't go babbling on like the Pharisees that we just start going and yap it and yap it. And it's a long winded prayer that <laughs> sounds really good. And we sound intelligent. God's, I don't think God's blessing. I don't think that that's, it's just words until our heart is aligning with him. Now here, I, I certainly am not trying to get anybody around this table to say something, you know, positive about a uh, one political person versus another. Right. But we are going into a presidential election year what specifically kinds of things, what issues and the like should we be praying about? What should we be, uh, how should we be ministering, even if it's from afar, to politicians that maybe we can't get to ourselves, but what, what kinds of things should we be praying for that, that really touch God's heart in terms of how a country should be run and how um, word should somehow get, the word of wisdom should get to these political leaders? that God wants this, not that, you know. I think, I think we're, we are charged by God. Not, he, he tells us to be specific in our prayers. But I think we need to be specific in guiding us, asking God to guide us and all other voters, and even our politicians who are in office or wanting to be in office, that God's will be done. Yeah. Don't do what, you know, we pray that the politicians don't do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Do what God would want them to do in that yeah. particular situation. And in our case as well, if we're going to pray on, our, on what we're going to vote for, we need to pray for guidance from God on what he would want us to do. Yeah. Does he want so-and-so in the office to accomplish this? Or would this person be better? Let him tell us what his will would be done. Could you see praying for, for instance, like us around this table, we certainly don't have any uh, clout in Washington by ourselves, but could you see us praying for Christians that can, can get close to those decision makers and be able to whisper in their ear what thus saith the Lord. Is that a form of ministry that Absolutely. would be helpful, you think? Well, I, yes, I do. And I think one of the, maybe one of the unpopular views of this is that, I think it was H.L. Mencken who said, the, uh, the American people get, deserve to get what they vote for and yeah, deserve to get yeah. it good and hard. <laughs> We are ultimately responsible for the people that we put in office yes, because that is the system of government that the founding fathers set up. So mm -hmm. it's on us. When we vote knuckleheads, it's because <laughs> we picked them. Now, and Randy, you made a great point. I think this was off camera where we can't get good, godly people to run for office because someone browbeats them. In there. Well, that's not how you serve your community. It's like, well, well, maybe it is. You know, maybe we need more people and better people to pick from. You can look at you know, the, the political and the presidential elections and go, really, this is, this is it? This is who we get to pick from? When I guarantee you there are way better people out there, but they never run for office because we don't encourage them because we just don't have that, that thing in there. But we can influence things a great deal, I think. Maybe not, you know, we can't pick how the, how the Senate looks or how the House of Representatives right, looks, right. but we can pick how our communities are run and we can pick how, who the people are that we send to advocate on behalf of us mm -hmm. and it, it starts with us and it always starts i'm convinced that washington does not have leaders they have followers and they will go where we tell them to go and if we're not telling them where we want them to go then they're just going to go wherever they want to go because we have the power of the vote because yeah because we have the power of the vote we have 
rights and responsibilities that the Apostle Paul didn't have, that Timothy didn't have, that those guys didn't have. It was the emperor, whatever he says, goes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're going to pray for him. But we can also pray for the people that we vote into those positions to make sure that they are, that they're doing the will of the people and that they're able to rightly discern the will of the people because it's 360 million people screaming for something else. So it's really difficult for anyone to say, well, I'm going to make sure that this gets done. But ultimately, we want to be a people that is seeking after God and what his will is. And again, yeah. once you get yeah. beyond that, it, it starts to get kind of messy. But, you know, that's the American is an advanced citizenship country. Yeah. You have to be able to deal with these kind of questions. And I also think about the scripture, that it's very close to my heart, when the, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. If we could get, you talked about how difficult it is to get some of these people to run for office, if we could get some people to have a sense and feel of the calling of God to do so. Yeah. And they do get into office and begin to implement godly things, the people will rejoice. Well, you know, I think one of the questions was, what are ways to pray for other people? Yes. Goes along with this. Which is, which is the fundamental question. Yes. Right. And, and it's the challenge, and I, I tell this people all the time, and you were reading about petition and intercession. If you're a parent and you have a kid that's wayward, you don't just pray. You're burdened. Yes. In intercession. Yes. You're feeling it. Sometimes you can't even talk. You're just bawling. God, save my son. Mm -hmm. God, save mm -hmm. my daughter. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, nobody has to teach you how to do that, right? It's just, it comes from, from oh, yes. who we are as parents. So the challenge is you cannot pray against someone's will. I it's said the that hardest somebody yesterday. thing to teach yes. people. Yes. You can pray for people all you yes. want, but if they want to be a knucklehead, they're going to be a knucklehead. Mm. Okay, I got you. <laughs> it's yeah. so yeah. true. Well, they have they have a freedom of choice. Yeah, that's, right. that's what he gave us. We have a, we have our own will. Yeah. I can will my kids to serve Jesus, but if my kid don't want to serve Jesus, I can't make them. God can't make them. Now I'm going to pray that He does everything He can to get their attention, short yeah. of taking their life, you yeah, know. Yeah. But at the same time, those are those are dangerous prayers. Yeah. But that's the difference, I think. Do we intercede for the presidential election? really pray like how important it really is instead of just do our little duty and check the box vote oh well guess we should have seen that coming <laughs> and feel bad for the next four years or do we really yeah. intercede and pray like we're yeah. we're praying to save our child yeah do we pray like that to save our country i don't know i think patrick hit it on the head um, when he started talking about in our local government you know and and pick one of your sports analogies it's our local government should be our minor leagues for Washington and, and, and the government. We oh, need yeah. to prepare our local government with our Christian based yeah. following and, and get them encouraged and encourage them to, to run. That is your feeder program to the, the higher offices mm -hmm. in our country. Right. And we need to start at home. Well, it's just like with our so kids. Much talk in the last couple of years about school boards. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're yeah. setting That's agendas right. and, and stuff that. And, I don't think any of us are going to believe in, you know, and, and they've become hotly contested offices to run for. Mm -hmm. And yet I guarantee you right here in Lima, there are two or three boards. They're asking people, will you run for the board? Yeah. Because yeah. nobody wants that responsibility. I don't want to make people mad. I don't yeah. want to hurt the teachers. I don't want to, you know, whatever it is. But if we're not willing to do some of these things, yeah. we can't expect it to get better. Let's hold it at that, yep. at that. I want to take a quick break. We're going to come right back. I want us to keep. Keep the conversation going. Okay. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We're, we're on to something good here, I think. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. We're back and uh, we're, we're, we're in this really good conversation here. You know, I, I, I'm one who definitely believes that a person, it, when it comes to Christian dumb, a Christian who's going to run for office should make sure he checks in with heaven to know that this is what God wants him or her to do. Amen. Mm -hmm. you know, otherwise, what's Absolutely. the point of doing it? But to that extent, we need, don't we need to encourage more people to look to God to see, yes, God, can you give me a green light? Should I do this? And if so, we need to give their backing. There is so much corruption as we were talking during the break and even with our producer. 
uh, there is so much corruption that it can, it can discourage a lot of people of good will right. from running to try to make a difference. Right. How, how, what do we do here? And, and considering the fact that there is no distance in prayer, and, and prayer does have power. He have great, it even has greater power than political power. Amen. If we, and I'm not trying to be philosophical about that. I mean, realistically, what do we do here? Because we need godly people on both sides of the political aisle. And I've said this in the past, I'll say it again, there's political corruption, corruption on both sides of the political aisle. Absolutely. We gotta match that with God's power. How, how do we do this, gentlemen? There's a, there's a story that goes back to, going back to, I guess, Roman times where a victorious general or emperor, usually they were the same thing, would be coming back from battle and they would have someone standing behind them in the, in the parade and as the, all this glory they're getting and there would be someone right behind them that would be whispering in their ear, only a man, only a man, making sure that they did not take this deification they were receiving too seriously. I think what we seem to be missing is evangelicals, Christians, what have you, are looked at more as a voting block than a plumb line. Mm -hmm. I think the, you know, the, the, the kings of Israel and Judah had occasionally, if they had good prophets, the prophetic ministry, was, is it, was, which isn't just telling the future. It seldom is about that. It's more about communicating this is what the Lord says mm -hmm. to that particular mm -hmm. leader. There's a lot of that, that that is missing in our culture. We don't have, it seems like to me, we don't have a lot of people that are willing to speak truth to power, as is the oft-abused phrase of saying, this is what God wants in terms of how we are leading. Like, we put you in this position you can be voted out, but while you are here, this is the expectation. This is what we feel like God should have you do. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's, that's a part of it that is missing. We have people that are more than willing to, especially on one particular side of the aisle, to court the evangelical vote, to quote the, the, quote the Christian vote, to court them rather, and say, hey, look, I, uh, I read the Bible. I, I quote two Corinthians all the time and do all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and yet they get into office and it's just, it, it's just a, yeah, yeah. a, a shtick. You know? mm -hmm. We don't have that calling them to account. And I think there, there needs to be more of that. Right. You know, and it, and it goes back to local, you know, are we willing to run for an office? Are we willing to serve? Um, and we can't get mad, be mad at others if they won't, if, if we're not willing. Um, now I think sometimes there's conflict of interest for pastors and, and being in certain areas, but I had a good friend in West Virginia that he was on a board member, board member and became board president down there. And, uh, he was able to push agendas from a biblical side that nobody else could have done. And he mm -hmm. did it because he won the hearts of people by his service to them. And he wasn't overtly religious. He wasn't overtly churchy. He just said, you know, there'll be no games on Wednesday nights protecting churches. Now this is 20 years ago, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, um, and that's when it started happening where youth groups couldn't meet on Wednesday anymore because there's ball games, there's stuff. It's that important that we, we take a stand locally or we're at least at the board meetings. You know, I, I think all the time I should go to a, a Bath Township meeting because that's where my church is located. I don't even know who's on the Bath Township. Shame on me. You know, how can I pray for people I don't even know? I, I criticize them when they vote something I didn't like, but do I know them? Do I know their makeup? Do I know why they voted that way? And should I then get involved and say, okay, maybe we don't need that person anymore and make sure I'm involved enough to make, make a difference. But most of us aren't. We just want to criticize what we don't like yeah. and vote. And that's what we do. And, and I think very often the Christians slant on things is never heard from the politicians simply because what you were saying, you, you, you may not even know who the politician is and you yeah. don't find out to, and you don't take that politician out to lunch or something and, and begin to explain from a biblical perspective what the Christian uh, point of view is. Yep. Should we have more of that? That is, that is not bent on political aspects, but the moral aspects of um, things. I am, um, one of my burdens I carry is that uh, I started ministry full time and I do this Manhood Restored podcast and we had the blessing of interviewing Nino Vitale. He's a state representative, he, he since termed out. but. He was the guy who was like, I don't care. I'm here to serve the Lord, 
vote me out, I don't care. He'd get behind closed doors with people and, and they'd say, hey, this is how it works. This is how we vote. Here's the, you know, and he's like, I don't care. <laughs> like they, they started to, to hate, you know, hate him because of that. But I think that that is like what we're called to do is to say, I serve Christ first mm -hmm. and un unapologetically. And that's right. where you start and that's where you stay and that's where you stick. And when you look to God first and you love God first and then you love men second, then we're actually able to see, get something done. And that's the type of thing. But I, I think it is men feeling the burden and the calling and then acting. I mean, there's times I just, I, I've stepped into leadership roles. Every time was because there was a burden there. Sure. That sure. I, I've said that word several times where it's this ache of like, wow, you know, these people, uh, they don't have a shepherd, so to speak, mm -hmm. and they need help mm -hmm. uh, with that. And then uh, I answer the call because what was Adam's sin? Apathy. He, he didn't mm -hmm. say, Eve, don't take that fruit. He's like, oh, okay, let's go along with it. Mm -hmm. And so we need to step up and we need to, to lead like that and, and answer that call. As I'm listening, I think one of the things that's wrong with us as the church is we're, we're too reactive and not enough proactive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. If, if, if a school board votes something crazy that would go against our conservative lifestyle of Lima, which we do live in a relatively conservative area uh, by a lot of means and standards, uh, but if something crazy were happening, immediately everybody would react and everybody would be at the school board meeting. But why aren't we there all the time, just hearing their heart, realizing the challenges they face and help make a difference and influence them by our presence mm -hmm. instead of just criticizing and showing up after they've done something we disagree with. Mm. Let me ch slightly change the subject. It can still fall into what we're talking about, but it, it, we have a, uh, another uh, viewer question. It says, what's... What is the difference between being a good person versus being a Christian? What's the difference between being a good person versus being a Christian? My, my response in the, in the traditional rabbinical uh, way to answer a question with a question would be, what do you define as good? Mm -hmm. Who is a good person? Mm -hmm. Well, I do this, that, or you know, I, I don't murder anyone. It's like, well, good. Most of us haven't murdered anyone. But the, the, difference, the main difference being is that, you know, in, in Jesus deals with this in, in Mark chapter 10. Um, when this person says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Only God is good. And then he like gives him the list. Well, follow the commandments. Don't do this. Don't do this. And most of us hit the commandments pretty well. Like we haven't committed adultery today. We haven't stolen today. Knows I'm saying today. We haven't murdered today. We haven't done these things. Like, so today is a really good day. But what Jesus always does is he will find the thing that we want to elevate over God in our lives. And he will say, you give that up. Mm -hmm. You remove that as an idol. And you pick up your cross and you come follow me. And what we see in this example is, in this particular, Jesus said, you're a really rich guy. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. And the guy wouldn't do it because he valued his riches more than he valued yeah. really a relationship with God. He was trying to he was trying to follow God for the bennies. He's trying to follow God for the benefits. So, you know, who's good? Who is willing to lay everything at the cross of Christ and then pick up their cross and follow him? That's what makes you good. And that belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that what makes you good. And his make, righteousness makes you good. And then on that point makes you a Christian because you believe in yes. Jesus Christ. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. See, that's the, that's the difference. It, <clears throat> to be a Christian, you want to be like God. You strive to be like God. Mm -hmm. To be a good person, you're doing acts. And a Christian doesn't do just acts. It tries to be like God and do what is necessary, what should be, not what good things look good. I guess I'm not doing very well explaining that, but that's... Uh, I, I wrote, it's like, are you being judged by your righteousness or God's, uh, you know, righteousness of Christ? I mean, like, I'm going to stand before God and tell him how good I am. Here, here's what I should get, and here's my list, and list it out for God. I'm going to go stand before God and, you know, be like, nope, <laughs> I'm not, you know, how bad I am, and how ultimately I'm trusting Christ for it. And I think the people want to convince you, like, I'm better than this person, so I want to, I, I'm going to stand before God on my works, you know, and here it is, God, here's, here's my resume. You're, I'm good enough to get in, right? And it's like, I'm like, nope, my resume is not good enough. I'm standing on the righteousness of Christ. Well, Jesus dealt with it in Matthew 7, 21. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
Many will say to me on that day, but Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons? I think that person would be pretty spiritual. And in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And it's really sad to think that there's going to be some people that did some really cool stuff for God are not going to be there. According to that scripture, not according to Randy Davis, because everybody get mad at me because I shared Jesus' words, but it's just truth. And I'm glad I grew up in a church that taught me that, that you can, and I, and I think we all as pastors know that we can get involved in the works of ministry and miss God. It's easy mm -hmm. because people demand so much sometimes and you, you just go and you serve and you give and you, and you do some of these acts works, mm -hmm. but you also have to have the time out. So we're not so busy. We're not even any good anymore. We're not doing it for the right reasons anymore. We're not serving the Lord. We're not doing his will. We're just doing what the people demand, kind of like some of our politicians that we were just <laughs> talking about. So it, we're, we all can be guilty, but the scripture is pretty plain. Just, just because you say, Lord, Lord. Mm -mm. You need a relationship with yeah. Jesus Christ. It goes back to reading the Bible, growing in your faith, being in fellowship, communion one with another. You know, it it's all goes together. And none of us are there yet. And I think we look at some people and say, well, Patrick's more spiritual than whoever. Don't do that. We're all a work in process. Yeah, we are. And uh, yeah. God's working on me. That's my favorite theme song. He's still working on me mm -hmm. because it, it, he just is. We're not there yet. And we'll never get there till we get there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but by his grace, we'll get there. Here's another question from a viewer that asks, how do we get back into spiritual shape if you've fallen away from God? We've got about 90 seconds to deal with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so it'll it. be. All right. <laughs> The only way it can happen is through prayer and surrounding yourself with other believers, yeah. like-minded people. That's yeah. the only way. Mm -hmm. I think it would just begin again. Start over. Don't, don't, don't stay there. You know, it's like the kid that falls. You've got to get him up, get him moving. You know, get back on the horse. Don't, don't stay there because that's what Satan does. He knocks you off. He makes you look stupid. He embarrasses you, humiliates you, and then you, you get down. Start over. God's ready to take you back. He's standing there with his arms reached out. Come on, I got you. Let's get back up. Let's keep walking mm -hmm. forward. Amen. Well, that, that, that Pray, way. repent, read. Get back on the horse. Discipline trumps motivation. Just do it. It's hard. I know. I don't care. Do it. <laughs> Isn't it quick? Tiny habits. You know, read for five minutes and start there. Just how you get in shape physically. You know, you run for a half mile and you're in shape. <laughs> you know, after you, you stretch it out then eventually. You're running a marathon. <laughs> okay. Well, that's it. That's all the time we have. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We appreciate you for these... Uh, for these uh, words of wisdom that you've shared with us here today, and we're happy to have you with us. And that's our program for today. We'll be back again, of course, next, next week at this same time. Until then, I'm Bill Harris for these fine ministers. God bless you for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.